If you remember going from ground to space combat, whacking stormtroopers with a stick, and taking on your evil twin brother, then you grew up playing Star Wars Battlefront Elite Squadron. And in this video, we're going to compare the PSP and DS versions of this game and explore its connection to the cancelled Battlefront 3. But first, let's set the scene. Now, officially, Elite Squadron was released in 2009 as a follow-up to the PSP exclusive Renegade Squadron, which was also developed by Rebellion Studios two years before. But there was also another Battlefront game which was supposed to be released in 2009. Now, the story of Battlefront 3's development and cancellation is long and filled with contradicting statements from various parties. But according to the Free Radical Archive, the flagship version of Battlefront 3 was in development by Free Radical since 2006. LucasArts also wanted a scaled down version of the game for the PS2 and PSP, and also a handheld port for the DS. The Nintendo DS port was given to Endspace to develop, while the PS2 and PSP game was given to Rebellion who just finished Renegade Squadron. Now, Free Radical's version of Battlefront 3 would be cancelled in 2008, and for a period of time LucasArts were hoping that Rebellion could upscale their version to the HD consoles, which they ultimately couldn't, but by early 2009 Rebellion did have a complete version of Battlefront 3 for the PSP and PS2. According to the Free Radical Archive, LucasArts decided to cancel the complete PS2 version and then rebrand the PSP game to Elite Squadron. Wow, that story has more twists and turns than the Star Wars saga itself. But what about the game we ended up getting? How good is it? Well, let's begin with the PSP version. And let's begin by covering the campaign mode, which is very much the centerpiece of this game. The story centers around two elite, experimental, and very special clones, imaginatively named X1 and X2. Both of them are brothers created from the DNA of a mysterious Jedi Master. You play as X2 and begin the campaign in the waning days of the Clone Wars under the command of Jedi Master Feroda, who was clearly modelled after that one guy who turned blue. We start with a tutorial mission on Tatooine where the game familiarises you with all the usual Battlefront weapons. Pistols, blasters, grenades and rocket launchers. The bigger the gun, the harder they fall. Apart from General Blueface over there who can take a rocket launcher to the face without flinching. Also, for some reason, all the troopers in this game are always doing the Superman pose. Anyway, in addition to all the old weapons, you also get melee weapons, which will play a much bigger role later on in the game. The stick combat is a nice addition, even if it is pretty basic and does cause the camera to lose its mind sometimes. And speaking of which, the PSP's single analog stick being mapped to both movement and camera control is still as cumbersome as it was in Renegade Squadron. Of course, this being a Battlefront game, we do get to pilot land vehicles, but in addition to that, we also get to fly starfighters inside the ground maps for the first time since Battlefront 1. The starfighter gameplay is very similar to Renegade Squadron, allowing you to either maneuver on your own or to tail the enemy using the autopilot lock-on feature. Now, the biggest and most impressive feature of Battlefront 3 was supposed to be the seamless transition between ground and space combat, which has made its way into Elite Squadron, sort of. You can go between ground and space, but due to the limited PSP hardware, they are technically two separate stages connected by a short cutscene that plays every time. But I still think this is really impressive for a PSP game. God damn it, I can't lock onto this stupid battle droid. Luckily for me, he's a complete idiot. Also, this time around, if you get close to droids, you can just smag them until they explode. Unlike Renegade Squadron, most of the maps in the campaign are actually brand new. Plus, they're quite a bit bigger this time. Okay, so we take out the droids, their dropships, the walkers, and then disable the control ship's shields using the ion cannon. We then go up into space and board their ship, which is another cutscene. You see, the ship's interiors are a bit bigger this time around, which is why they've also been broken off into a separate environment. But the goal is still the same as always, make your way into the core and blow up some kind of generator. Alright, next up is the Battle of Coruscant. Now, this being a PSP game, the battle itself does feel quite empty. Every now and then you'll see a cruiser fly by, but that's about it. So we get inside the droid ship, sabotage it, and then take the escape pods down to the surface. Oh, Coruscant, the whole planet is just one big texture. Oh look, it's Master Windu! And I see the Jedi are as cunning on the battlefield as they were in the first game. Well, come on, there's a tank there, are you gonna do something about it? Nope, look, it just goes to hide behind the thing. And speaking of which, in addition to the Bacta stations and the Gong droids, you also have these kiosks which let you change your weapon loadout similar to the classes in the console games. Plus, Renegade Squadron's points-based customization system 
also makes a comeback. The Coruscant level ends with an epic battle against General Grievous. Well, I say epic, it is just you smacking him in the back while he fights Mace. Up next is Cato Nymordia. We start in space and then fly down planet side to this nice map on one of the ring cities. And as cool as this is on PSP, you can't help but think of how awesome it would have been as part of the flagship Battlefront 3. On the ground, we get a hold of a magic sniper rifle that will always hit your target as long as you're pointing in its general direction. X2 then uses his latent force abilities to perform a master chief jump. We then get inside Newt Gunray's palace, which apparently has been modeled after Scarface's mansion. Look, the walls are all red. He's got a giant office. There's even a big globe. What's that? A collect call from Palpatine? Yeah, I'll accept. All right, time to take out Master Smurf. And this level really is like the end of Scarface. Look, this guy takes round after round and just keeps going. He must be on some death sticks. You killed your first Jedi. Now let's follow Palpatine's orders and hunt down the rest. Okay, well, apparently not, because X2 decides to have a sudden change of heart, grow out his hair, and then join the rebellion on Dantooine, where he runs into Jedi Master Aragon, who lays down this bombshell. The Camino cloners must have taken my genetic information without my consent. With it, they made you, my son. Wow, that's a lot to take in. I think I'm gonna need some time to... What, what? The stormtroopers are attacking? Okay, never mind. This map has a weird rustic charm about it. It's like Rohan meets Belgium. I like it. Oh no, not the rustic charm. Thank God we can hide in this ancient cave, which comes with a back-to machine and a charging station. I'm letting our men die, X2. Do something. Where are you going, my son? We must hurry to the hangar. Attend to that door, X2. Look, Dad, I'm really happy we got to connect, but do you mind getting off my back? He's also a terrible person. Look at this. Stormtroopers just shooting his men two feet away. Meanwhile, what is he doing? Just standing there with his cloak billowing? Well, not for long, because soon X1 arrives, kills the old man, steals his lightsaber, wounds his brother, and then bails. Wow, a lot of things happened in this level. You can also tell where the Battlefront 3 cinematics were supposed to be because they've been replaced by the old space scroll. And so some time has passed. General Kota, yes that one, has apparently recruited X2 into the Rebel Alliance. And his first task is an easy one, just a reconnaissance mission to the Death Star. Nice landing. Thanks. Oh, never mind. Now this one is a slightly modified version of the Death Star map from the first game. And the single analog controls really make it difficult to navigate around all these tight corridors. Thankfully it's a short level. Next up is a level on Yavin where X2 and this random girl help the rebels evacuate. And we also learn that X2 can't swim. But I'll tell you what he can do now, the old Jedi moon jump. Also, Cole Serra from Renegade Squadron makes a cameo. At this point, you've pretty much figured out Elite Squadron's main gameplay loop. You have the ground sections where you take out the enemy, fix something, blow something up, and use the orbital cannon. You then hop inside a ship and go into space where you take out a few starfighters, blow up some radar dishes, then get into the main enemy ship and sabotage it from the inside. Sometimes it's the inverse, like the Hoth map where you start in space and then go down to the planet. It's the same map as the first Battlefront game, but it's really cool being able to approach it from space. Look, there's the walker, the shield generator, the ion cannon. There's even a very low poly falcon in the hangar. Do we get to fly the speeders? No, but you do something even more fun. Escort this astromech across Echo Base. At this point, X2 also unlocks the melee class loadout, which means you can run around swatting stormtroopers with a tiny baton. Speaking of which, you do run into X1, who has now turned to the dark side. Two, the ship's going to blow. Get off it now. Hold on, let me get a few more smacks on this guy. We then move to the Battle of Endor, which seems to be tailor-made for this game. We start off in space, taking on the fleet, then get inside the Mon Cal cruiser and fight off the stormtroopers. And this is the only Star Wars game where you'll see Admiral Akbar elbow stormtroopers in the face. Then it's down to the forest, where you free a bunch of Ewoks, blow up some Star Destroyers, and take down a few walkers. Back, back, I tell you. Now, the campaign doesn't actually end at at Endor. The last third of the story takes place a few years after episode 6, where X2 has now been trained by Luke to be a Jedi. The first level is Bespin, and sure, it's not as big as the one from Rogue Squadron, but it's still pretty good for a PSP game. And this is where the melee combat reaches its final form. In addition to regular attacks, X2 is now able to use the Force, deflect blaster bolts, and throw his saber. Damn, Lando sure is smooth. There is absolutely no wind in this room, and his cloak is still built. 
going. This level has you escort Lobot across the map and then take on the Dark Troopers. This is followed by a mission to Darth Vader's castle on the desert planet of v v that's right, the very same castle and planet from Jedi Academy. And while this version of the castle is obviously nowhere near as big as the one from that game, it's still really cool to get this throwback. The campaign's final level starts in space above Mustafar. We land on the Star Destroyer and confront Uncle Fester, I mean X1. After a brief battle, he flees to the surface, which is comprised of this really cool map formed around this downed Venator. That's right, Fallen Order, Battlefront did it first. You confront X1 who throws the kitchen sink at you. He's got tanks, red guards with machine guns, evil clone Wookiees. And so Space Jesus kills Uncle Fester before finding love in the arms of this random girl from the Yavin mission. Chewie, Han and Luke then show up for some reason and that's it for the campaign. Now this being a Battlefront game, it is filled with a bunch of other gameplay modes. We have the classic instant action mode, which focuses more on the traditional Battlefront style of gameplay with modes like Conquest, and capture the flag. Only this time they're set across a three-dimensional plane, on the ground, in space, and inside the command ship. All the maps from the campaign are playable in this mode, but there's also a new version of Kashyyyk which was supposed to be the last mission of Battlefront 3's campaign, where X2 defeats X1. Hero mode returns with a selection of classic characters along with some new additions, like the two clones, General Kota, Episode 2 Obi-Wan, and Old Ben. Galactic Conquest also returns. But this time, in addition to classic conquest, you also get a bunch of different scenarios with select planets. And despite its single player focus, Elite Squadron still carries over both the multiplayer modes from Renegade Squadron, plus a strategy based galactic conquest multiplayer that you can play on a single PSP. And so that's it for the PSP game, but of course there was also a DS version developed by Endspace, who did the DS port of The Force Unleashed a year prior. And it shows because Elite Squadron DS reuses both the engine and the visual style from that game. The long scrolls and recycled film cinematics have been replaced with these cutscenes that are made up of static art on the top screen and dialogue on the bottom. And despite being a completely different game, this version still retains the core elements of Elite Squadron. We've got primary and secondary weapons, the lock-on feature, the back to stations, and the different loadout classes. In addition to the standard shooter sections, you also get these vehicle missions. These sections are also filled with little easter eggs, for example on Tatooine you get the Kray Dragon and the Sarlacc Pit. You do get space combat, but this time you can only turn left and right, not up and down. Luckily all of your enemies are also staying on a two-dimensional plane. And there are also sections inside the command ship, but they're pretty much the same as the ground levels. And every now and then you also get these turret sections. Oh no, they're attacking Coruscant, we have to get episode 1 era Palpatine to safety. The boss battles have also been expanded, for example the Grievous fight has you chucking grenades at him which will launch him into the oncoming traffic. Every now and then you also get one of these in-engine cutscenes. Oh the humanity! Look they had a thousand different Anakin screenshots to use for his dialogue icon and they decided to go with the one where he's watching Mace Windu get zapped. Now the DS version follows the same plot as the PSP game however it actually expands on the story. We get a lot more dialogue between characters which explains things a bit better. For example this time X2 doesn't just suddenly decide to grow a mullet to leave the Empire and meet his father on Dantooine, you actually get to see the rift between the two brothers and show X2's moral struggle. You also get to see how X2 joined the Rebel Alliance and met Kota. Instead of going straight to the Death Star, he starts with this mission to the Desolation Station, what a name. And then another mission to Geonosis, which starts with a space battle against Boba Fett, followed by a trip through the droid factory with General Kota. Another difference is that X2 actually takes part in the Death Star trench run protecting Luke from the ties. There is also a morbid little easter egg in this version, look you can see all the stormtroopers floating in space after the Death Star explodes. The Bespin mission has also been replaced by a mission to Dathomir where X2 fights this Night Sister on top of a Rancor. And for some reason this version ends with this panel where Luke is third wheeling an intimate moment between X2 and his lady friend. Apart from the campaign, the only other mode in this version is instant action 
which you can either play on your own or with three other players over local wireless. There are four regular maps and two hero maps. There are six heroes and it's a free for all with no sides. And so there we have it, Battlefront Elite Squadron. And playing this game is a bit of a bittersweet experience, especially on PSP, because you're constantly reminded of what could have been if its big brother had seen the light of day. It's clear that Battlefront 3 was going to be a very ambitious game. And I find it really ironic that the closest we ever got to it was on the poor PlayStation Portable, which was already struggling to run a version of Battlefront 2. Yes, they had to cut a lot of corners and the limitations of the hardware are very much apparent, but I still have to give it up to Rebellion for doing their best to condense a game of that size and scope onto the PlayStation Portable. But that's just my take. Please let me know if you'd like to see me do a full video on Battlefront 3 where I try to piece together what the original game was supposed to be like. In the meantime, please leave a comment with your thoughts and memories of Elite Squadron. Where do you rank it amongst classic Battlefront games? How well do you think it implemented all the different gameplay elements? And what was your favorite new map? As always, thanks for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.